Megan Weatherby, the Executive Director of the Art Deco Society of New York, and I'm extremely excited to welcome you to our video event exploring what makes Mumbai the Art Deco Jewel of India. For those of you new to the Art Deco Society of New York's online events, our mission is to bring people together to preserve, explore, and celebrate the architecture, design, and culture of the 1920s and 30s. For this event, we are joined by the wonderful team of the Art Deco Mumbai Trust, which includes Nitya Iyer, the Head of Documentation and Research, Vishaka Bahat, their Senior Associate of Documentation, and of course, Atul Kumar, Art Deco Mumbai Trust's Founder and Trustee. For the past 15 years, Atul has been actively working to document and create awareness about Mumbai's Art Deco buildings especially within South Mumbai's Art Deco Heritage Precinct. He is passionate about conservation, civic governance issues, nature and the environment, and saving Mumbai's iconic living Art Deco heritage. He is also the board of several trusts and works for preservation of open spaces, civic issues, and social welfare. So now, please welcome Atul. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I'm excited to deliver this presentation today and to bridge the cultural divide between Mumbai and New York. Um, thanks to Roberta for actively engaging between Art Deco Society of New York and the Art Deco Mumbai Trust in Mumbai. We're going to take you today from New York to Mumbai, which is the red dot that you see on your screen. Uh, across the Atlantic, Europe, the Middle East, uh, till you touch down in Mumbai. This map over here is a close-up of India, and you can see that we're on the western coast. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a close-up of the island city of Mumbai, uh, which has got a narrow connection to the mainland at, at, at this location in Thani. And interestingly, it's surrounded by water on three sides. When you look at Manhattan and you look at Mumbai, I, it's amazing how many similarities there are. You have, as I said, water on three sides. You have a strong south to north axis. You have constrained development on the east and western front. And the entire pressure and geography of the city's development is basically northwards. What you also see on the slide on the left is the port of Mumbai, and you can see how it's a sheltered harbor, and that enabled ships to come in all weather, including the Indian monsoon, which can be pretty severe, and permitted trade to take place through the year, irrespective of the month. The evolution of Bombay is very interesting. It was never one consolidated landmass. It consisted of seven islands, which you can see on the left, and you can see that there was basically equal swathes of water and equal patches of land. Um, the earliest inhabitants were the Portuguese, and Princess Catherine Braganza was married with King Charles II, who didn't particularly see any value in the islands that he received as dowry. And he rented them out to the East India Company in 1668 for just 10 pounds a year. And little did he know that this would be the crown jewel in the British Empire. Bombay was a thriving port city. It exported cotton to Europe and to England, to all the hungry mills in, the, in Britain, and they exported opium to China in the East. This thriving trade, of course, increased the prosperity of the country and its businessmen and its traders, but even more significantly when the American Civil War broke out because there was a huge shortage of cotton which drove prices sky high and people literally became millionaires overnight. Even the opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 shortened the time it took to ship a consignment by steamer to England 
from five months just down to two months. And there was a continued reclamation of land that took place so that all the seven islands gradually became one big landmass, which we know today as Bombay. And Bombay then earned the title of Herbs Prima in Indus, and only in 95 was it renamed to Mumbai. Art Deco in India is not synonymous only with Mumbai. It actually dominates the architectural landscape of the city in Bombay and across the country. And you will see here, as we move from Mumbai, it dots the entire country. And I have just selected the major cities which most people may be familiar with. And you can see that it goes across all the way to the north, the east, the west, and the south, uh, across small towns and big. There are cinema houses, there are, there are residential buildings, and there are even royal palaces, all in the deco style. Deco came to Bombay in the 30s as, you know, the educated and prosperous middle class grew increasingly wealthy. Uh, due to the city's expanding port commerce. There was also a pressing requirement for housing to meet this aspirational class's prosperity and need to have a modern living style, which basically initiated the Back Bay Reclamation Scheme, which was a very, very major landfill program. Uh, the role of cement marketing companies has to be highlighted because they were offering not just reinforce concrete cement as a new construction material, but they were giving you an aspiration for a modern home. And that was the plank they used to sell their cement. And a new city that was prosperous, required a new architecture, and the streamlined modern style from Paris just fit that bill perfectly. And the city's first Art Deco district church gate was built in the 1930s. In this next slide, which was taken by Hassler in 1930s, and I've always wondered how he got this aerial shot, um, you can see the congested development of the city in the background. It's dense and it's completely built up. In the foreground, you can see a large oval park with about 600 palm trees dotting its perimeter. And what you can now see with highlighted in yellow, is all land that was <clears throat> created by what they called pushing back the sea or dry filling and instead of reclamation. And in the background, in the yellow circle, is the port, and you can see water over there. And, of course, that's the beginning of the port, and it extends even deeper inside. This, is, was, this was the first development of Mumbai in the section that's highlighted in yellow that heralded the arrival of Art Deco in the city. But it didn't just begin here. You know, when you look at the map of Mumbai and you see the number of cities, uh, the, sorry, the number of neighborhoods that uh, had Art Deco construction, it literally spans the length and breadth of the city all the way from the south, then going gradually up to the north. And for those of you who are familiar with Bombay, you'll see virtually every major neighborhood popping up on this map. And the last one here is what you can see is the equivalent of the Bronx uh, and was the later development as a suburb in Mumbai. You can't look at Art Deco in Mumbai purely as an architectural style. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's part of the urban and social fabric of the city. You cannot see it in isolation just as a style that came in for 10 years and exploded across the city. Bombay is a city that was built by its citizens. It, housing and development was not undertaken by the state. The state only reclaimed land and then offered it to people to build homes and buildings that they could live in. And the, the key person who was missing in this whole piece was the developer. And that allowed families to build and own buildings. 
if you look at the typologies, you'll notice there are so many different types that comprise this circle that completes the emotional quotient. Uh, there are healthcare properties, so you could have been born in an art deco hospital, like Breach Candy. You could then have lived in an apartment home that was art deco, gone to a school or a college that was deco, in all likelihood worked in an office in your first job and made your career in an art deco building. And you, your places of entertainment, like the cinema theaters, were all art deco palaces. Um, and in the evenings, you went to a club for social interaction and for a drink and to meet people and enjoy yourself. So it really was beyond just a style. It, it encompassed your lifestyle and it, it traveled across four generations. So the sense of ownership and the emotional connect to Art Deco in Bombay goes well beyond the architectural style. Here is the row of buildings that were first built uh, at the Eros, I'm sorry, at the Oval Maidan, just opposite the earlier development, which is all to the right of these uh, palm trees that you see over here. 18 buildings and plots were put up for development. These 18 plots, interestingly, had a common mandate for development. They were to be only five floors high. They had to have a flat roof, flat facades. They had to be, every plot was, plot was cuboidal in shape. You had to have the same setback on all sides. The construction material was reinforced concrete. And that really, you know, it was a huge challenge for an architect because with so many restrictions, they had to rely on their ingenuity to create a unique style and a unique identity for each apartment building. The first building I'm going to talk to you about is Sunshine. And here you can enjoy the architectural lettering, which in this case is made out of wrought iron metal. And uh, Lettering was not just lettering. You can see the sunburst motif behind the sunshine lettering. It was part of the identity of the building. It was a design element that was absolutely visually stunning. Uh, it, they were made of metal. They were made of wood. They were made of concrete. And it was ornamentation at its best. And every building had a different lettering and a different form. The next building I'd like to show you is Empress Court, another magnificent street corner. You can look at the streamlined balconies in the image on the left, built by contractor Kanga and Company with architect G.V. Mahatre. The image on the right is the front lobby as you enter. This is the elevator cage. Look at the fine teakwood paneling that extends from the bottom to all, to all the way up to the ceiling. And I, I particularly enjoy that Art Deco grill of industrial design that's placed on top. And this format of the elevator cage and the paneling is, is still there on every floor. So there was a certain uniformity in design and a harmony in design that this practice followed. Shiv Shanti Bhavan is, is a gorgeous piece of work. It, it was done by Mehrwanji Bana, again an Indian architect who went to England, came back, and, and you know, this is a riot of colors. It's a street corner showpiece. I, I love the play of yellow and green and the, the beautiful geometrical designs on the facade and the clever way he's used the the street corner facing facade to showcase the main aspect of the building in a manner that you can see it either from the south or from the east and you would still appreciate its beauty. And on the right side here is the main road, but he intelligently and discreetly put the entrance to the building on the left. I also like to talk about the air conditioning units that have been fitted. These are very, very sensitive additions. And if you'll notice, each air conditioner has been fit only in a fixed approved slot where typically you would have the ventilator window. So they've maintained the symmetry of the building 
and they've respected the original teakwood windows and kept all the balconies intact in this building. Well, arguably one of the finest pieces of Art Deco conservation and preservation in the city. This window is in a building right next to Shiv Shanti Bhavan, built by, again, the same architect, Merwanji Bana and Company in 36. And you can see the sunburst design below the window. And these windows extend all the way from floor one up to floor five. Um, we call this building for its flamboyance and its color. We call it the Jazz Queen of Bombay. Uh, you can see the Egyptian influence. We once took a bunch of school children on a on an Art Deco walking tour, and two of them likened the motifs at the bottom to origami and said, this looks exactly like you would when you unfolded paper. And we live and learn by looking at the different ways people interpret and see the same images. Uh, on the window, I'd like to highlight this diagonal mullion. This diagonal mullion, incidentally, serves no purpose in holding the glass in place or in supporting the frame of the window. The diagonal mullion has been placed here by the architect so that it's part of a design aesthetic. And this fits in with the overall front facade of the building. Court view uh, by Merwanji Bana, another building by Merwanji Bana, looks very ordinary if you look at the image on the right. It, in fact, it has almost nothing going for it. And that can be deceptive. What you see on the left is a huge, gorgeous frozen fountain that is hidden behind the tree on the image on the right. Uh, it also has these interesting balconies at eye level uh, over here on floor two. So you can make out that the the frozen fountain and the wave-like balconies are only at eye level. And then after that, above that, the building looks pretty ordinary. These balconies, here's a close-up for you, uh, are what we call the waveform balconies. And you can appreciate the relief work which shows crashing waves, a symbolic of you know, Bombay being so close to the sea. And of course, likewise with the wave pattern balconies. We have only one set uh, that we've seen like this across the city. The interiors of this property are as stunning as the, uh, as stunning as the frozen fountain. And here you can see the clever use of light. So the frozen fountain has a fixed glass behind it, which lets in so much natural light into the stairwell that it doesn't need lighting during the day at all. Uh, you can see terrazzo flooring on the bottom left-hand side. You can see the beautiful metal silver grill work going up. And I particularly like the stepped silver pattern that mimics the steps going up on both sides, providing a unique harmony and design. And this is also very cleverly done because there's an interplay of colors and silver and dark brown, which complements the work on the interior line of the staircase. And up here you can see, uh, you can't see them, but there are louvered windows, which again allow both light and air. So there was a lot of focus on using natural elements while designing these buildings. Bombay, by virtue of its location on the ocean uh, and the weather that it has during, you know, 12 months of the year with a very hot summer and a very, very wet monsoon, and we've just begun that, has a representation of tropical features. So you have ocean waves, sunburst rays, the moon, tropical flora and fauna, very common motifs that you see on buildings. And these are visually represented through bas relief, metal balcony grills, ornamental gates and porch railings and etched panels. <clears throat> One very, very important feature about Bombay's architecture, which makes it very unique, is that architects work to make homes and offices comfortable and give you a quality of life that would add 
to your style of living and your quality of living. So they worked with local conditions, geographic conditions, and climactic conditions. The eyebrow of Chajja was basically a cantilevered ledge that was located above a window in many of Bombay's buildings. I would block out the sun and it would <clears throat> provide shade. And it was also cleverly used to accentuate the rhythmic horizontality of the building. The balcony was a cantilevered projection that basically served the dual purpose to provide not only sh not only shade and but also act as a viewing gallery where when the weather was pleasant enough, you could sit there. Sadly, today's architecture seems to confront the environment and almost challenge it with very li little regard for, for architecture to be responsive to the climate in an environmentally friendly way. We come back to Shiv Shanti Bhavan and let me just illustrate here what I mean by eyebrows, for those of you who are not entirely familiar with the term. So what you've just seen, the yellow highlights on your screen, those are the eyebrows. And we call Shiv Shanti Bhavan the eyebrow queen of Bombay. She has 15 eyebrows beautifully laid out, one on top of the other, and a very intelligent way of using vertical banding to give a sense of height using verticality, because all the buildings were restricted in size to just five floors each. On the right, you can see Sunshine. Sunshine has a, a horizontal band over here, and this eyebrow basically provides protection to the recessed balcony that you can see uh, behind the logo of the nameplate. The eyebrow was not just a single extension. It was also ran continuously across many buildings. And this is a fine example of the home of Mafatlal, Mr. Mafatlal, the textile magnates who prospered during the times when the cotton textile mills were <clears throat> doing extremely well. This home still exists. The family still lives there. And it's, it's a magnificent work by Master Sati and Bhuta who designed a lot of deco in Bombay. Here you'll see what I mean by continuous running eyebrows. So you can see how the eyebrow was not just one extension, but it was used to wrap around the entire property. And therefore it became effectually a design element that accentuated horizontality. And it served a dual purpose of, of course, providing protection. In Commonwealth, I'll introduce you to the balcony. So the balcony is the protrusion that you see on the side of the building. These are called, we refer to these as locomotive balconies because of the way they look like locomotive engines in terms of their streamlined long form and curvature in the front. Here again, you can see the <clears throat> continuous running eyebrow has been so thoughtfully placed before the, below the balcony, and again, accentuating the rounded curve of the corner of the building. You can also see ship deck railings uh, on top of the balcony here, and you can, these are made of wood and mimic what you would see on a ship. You can also see, I'm sorry, you can also see on the image on the right in green fields, the use of two-tone coloring, so you can see the green, dark green color used to highlight the horizontal banding. And likewise, on Commonwealth, you can see the dark rust color, which highlights the vertical movement from left to right as your eye moves across the darker color. After the oval precinct, which we've just seen, I'll now move you to Marine Drive, which is the crown jewel of the city also called the Queen's Necklace. Um, it was, again, built on reclaimed land and was one of the major reclamation projects with a lot of controversy over its development. But what ultimately turned out was a magnificent bay with a row of 35 consecutive Art Deco buildings. Here again, you'll notice in the image on the left, they're all of the same height and providing a unique massing that, that was 
uh, provided a visual form that is very pleasing to the eye. These buildings are still intact and hold a uh, stand tall even to this day. On the right, you can see the Arabian Sea, and then you can see the line of buildings along the coast over here. And you can see all the development coming up here. Uh, and a large part of this is still open ground, but a lot of it, of course, has now been fully built up as part of the Back Bay Reclamation Plan. The <clears throat> 35 buildings and Marine Drive have soft golden yellow lighting, uh, which makes it look like a string of pearls. And that's why it's called the Queen's Necklace. And you remember I mentioned the emotional quotient and the sense of ownership that citizens have with this area. Well, at some point, uh, the government decided that we need to be energy conscious and we need to migrate to LED lamps. And overnight, they changed the street lighting across the entire bay from the golden yellow lights to white LED lights. You can imagine the furor that took place as citizens were most upset because it changed the character and the image of, of Marine Drive completely. And in what was a, a, an exceptional case, the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, Somoto intervened without any public petition and held the state responsible and asked for the reasoning behind uh, the changing of the lighting. Needless to say, uh, to cut a long story short, we have the golden yellow lights back. They are LED, but they're the right shade and the right color. And the queen's necklace remains intact. You can see on the image on the left, you can see so many cars. And, you know, these, many of these were American. You have Chevrolets, you can see a Buick 8, there's a Dodge, there's a Plymouth, there's a Studebaker. And interestingly, in the 1920s, there was a plant, there was a Ford plant in Mumbai, and there was a General Motors plant in Mumbai. So these markers also show the visual, visually present to us the prosperity of Mumbai as reflected in the aspirational automobiles that wealthy Indians were owning and driving. This massing of 35 buildings led UNESCO to remark that the Art Deco buildings are one of the largest and most homogenous assemblages of Art Deco buildings in Asia and the world. This is a unique honor bestowed as part of the World Heritage Site inscription that was obtained in June 2018. And I'll talk to you a little more about that a little later. We now move to Marine Drive, and I'm, I'd like to show you a few pictures of some of the buildings so you can appreciate the architecture and the style. Suna Mahal, and this is a street corner facing building across two very major roads in the city, has this magnificent turret at the rooftop that sits like a crown. And this was basically meant to be both of two things. One, a viewing gallery, so you could see the sun setting over the Arabian Sea, and it was meant to be a social space where in the evening residents came up, they met, they socialized, they had a drink, watched the sunset, and then had a happy ending to their day. You'll observe the streamlining of this building, the use of two colors to accentuate both verticality through the vertical bands running up down the middle, and the accentuation below the balconies in red, which run both to the left and to the right. It is beautifully maintained and it was built by Mr. Kavaschi Sidwa, who decided that he wanted a home for his family. Mr. Sidwa was Bombay's most prominent bootlegger. And his grandson relates that he thinks his grandfather's hooch was a lot better than what you get in the wine shop even today. Here we see another street corner facing building, again, built by late Mr. Govind Ram Sekseria, who was the cotton king of the world and the first member of the New York Cotton Exchange from India, a very humble man, but a very wealthy man. He built this home 
for his family so that they could all live together. And again, you can see, you know, the fluted vertical bands that run up the middle and then the street corner facade again is very similar in overall massing and style to Suna Mahal, which I just showed you in the previous image. And yes, I must mention Suna Mahal is also the inspiration behind our logo. Uh, and it is now a, a huge part of the collective memory of the residents of Bombay. This is the interior lobby of, of, of Six Area Building. And you can see the rich colors of Italian, fine Italian marble imported and laid out here. Uh, interestingly, it's clad all the way up to the ceiling. And that just shows that Mr. Saxaria really spared, you know, no expense to make a magnificent home for his family. You can see the entrance the doorway with two solid teakwood doors, uh, very cleverly done with small holes to allow light and air in again. Nautical features played a big part in Bombay's design, particularly on Marine Drive. Uh, Bombay was affected by the excitement of the era's ocean liners calling at the port. They epitomized modernity, elegance, grandeur. They related to the Hollywood films that they were seeing in the cinema theaters. And these factors in Bombay's proximity to the sea resulted in many nautical features being manifested in Bombay's buildings. Porthole windows, you saw the ship deck uh, style railings, and you also saw the observatory tower on Suna Mahal. Uh, this is Sonawala building, again a family-owned building, and this family still stays here to this day. Notice the palm, the palm trees which were planted all along Marine Drive, very Miami-like. And of course, you can see the porthole windows running up the, the central median all the way up to floor six. Uh, this building also was designed by Master Satya and Bhuta, who were one of the most prolific practices in Art Deco buildings in the country. Here's a close-up of the balcony, and you can see the red banding again, highlighting both the design and drawing your eye, red and white contrasted against white. You can see the porthole window on your right-hand side, the ship deck railing on the balcony. And I particularly like these, these gaps that they've made in the balcony to allow air, which have been built into the concrete, which is quite an engineering feat for that day and age. We also saw, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but across the oval, we have buildings which are named like Moonlight, Empress Court, uh, St. James Court, which all reflected colonial aspirations. In Marine Drive, you see a shift and you see an emerging Indian identity, which is represented by the naming convention of these buildings. So Indian families in the 1940s, India was still not an independent country, now had the desire to name their buildings after themselves or their families. And you can see uh, Sex Area, Suna, Rajab, which were all named after an Indian identity or a family. Bharatiya Bhavan was earlier named Jeevan Vihar and Mr. Jeevan Bhai Parikh was the original gentleman who made that building. I'll now transition to Bombay's Art Deco cinemas. They played a huge role in, in entertainment and as spaces of modernity and luxury. And I think as New Yorkers, you would appreciate seeing this connection between cinemas in New York and in Bombay. The Regal Cinema was built, uh, one of the first Art Deco buildings in the city, interestingly built by Charles Stevens. Um, whose father actually built the most magnificent Victorian Gothic building. It's ironical that his son chose to build right next to his father's building, uh, Bombay's first modern Art Deco building. Now, Regal was very special for many reasons. It was the first air-conditioned cinema theater, and that was a big deal. It had neon lighting. It had underground parking, which was unheard of. 
And most importantly, when we saw the brochures that announced the launch of Regal, it said, we have special seats with connections for the hearing impaired. Such was the level of advanced thinking that went into the design of these edifices. Here's a quick picture of the inside of the cinema house. You can see marble flooring and you can see the extensive use of teakwood paneling. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the elevator doors with their brass handles. And of course, the paneling, the paneling runs throughout the entire cinema. And the Oscar uh, etched into the mirror on the landing on the first floor. The Ross Cinema, which you see here, built by architect Sorabji Bhedwar, is probably Bombay's most iconic tribute to the step profile or the ziggurat. Uh, and as I really don't need to explain that to you, this image says it all. It's a magnificent building built in a V shaped and clad with red Agra stone. Uh, it's at the junction of three major roads directly opposite with the Churchgate station, which is something like the Penn Station of New York. And it, it, it holds a very special place in the hearts of every person who's lived in this city or who's worked in this city or grew up in this city. And these kind of social places really make people remark that, you know, once you've lived in Bombay, you can leave Bombay, but Bombay never leaves you. Here's a glimpse of the inside of this theater. Uh, on the left is the lobby, and you can see the, the circular brass railings. Uh, on the right side, these relief works in plaster run down the length of the cinema theater on either side. The top one uh, shows the making of a film set, so you can see you know, carpenters and people working and erecting and constructing a set. And in the bottom one, you can see a cinematographer, a director, you can see props, and you can see the star cast. So there's a whole storyline within the theater. And of course, the film itself is what you've come to enjoy. The Liberty Cinema is undoubtedly the crown jewel of Bombay cinemas. It was built in 1947, completed in 1949, and is Bombay's ode to the frozen fountain. It is quite incredible how just one single design element has been created with so many different variations and treatments in the entire cinema, in all its design and decorative elements. What you see here at the entrance to the cinema and you can, uh, the lighter colored wood is the Canadian cedar, and the darker wood is uh, Burma teak. And the entire cinema interior is only with these, built with these two materials clad on all the surfaces. Apparently, the Canadian Consul General visited the cinema two, three years ago and met late Mr. Nazir Hussain, the owner of the cinema, uh, and he remarked that you know, this kind of quality cedar is not even available in Canada anymore. Uh, Mr. Hussein built the showplace of the nation, as Liberty was affectionately called. And I'd now like to share a short film clip with you to hear what he had to say about the love of his life. Uh, Vishaka, could you play that, please? By the end of World War II, every cinema in South Bombay was screening English product. It may have been from Hollywood, it may have been from Britain, wherever, but the language was English. By that time, there was a crying need for, a, for an outstanding cinema to show Hindi pictures, Hindustani pictures and Liberty filled that void magnificently. It was called the Liberty 
Bharti cinema because we started in 47. India got its independence at that time and that name didn't take too long to establish. The formal opening was a film of Mehboob Khan called Andaz. And the curtain opened sideways in those days. The screen was small and now it's vertical because the screen is as big as it can get. As there were ribbons tied across, I cut one of the two ribbons and a young daughter of Moti Chand who built this cinema cut the other ribbon. There were no ministers and all the rest of that. Thank you, Vishaka. At the same time, there was an emerging Indian identity. Uh, Swadeshi here means one's own country. Uh, and with varying degrees of Indian iconography, local architects began in melding visual tradition to incorporate Indian symbols into the architecture with the, without disturbing the overall integrity of the style. The use of malad stone on commercial buildings and regional narratives like trade, commerce, agricultural practices began to being showcased on our deco building. What you see here is the New India Assurance Building in Fort, another fine piece of work by Master Satya and Bhuta, who collaborated with the young Enji Pansare, who had just returned from the Royal College of Arts in Britain. And you can see this is very trademark Pansare work. He loved making larger than life relief works. And you can see the, the almost 80 foot tall statues that he carved on the front of the building on the facade. And on the right side, you can see a panel that adorns the entrance of the building. And you can see here again, a very honest and clear native symbolism. There's industrial labor, it's, it's wearing traditional Indian clothing, the headgear is Indian. The lady here is wearing a sari. And this gentleman also is wearing an Indian outfit. And yet in this picture, if you look here at the top left, you have a steamer. And below that, you have a wave pattern uh, symbolizing sea and trade. And <clears throat> you have a picture of a man working on a grinder. And here you have a picture of a woman working on a loom. So there was this clear shift towards representing Indian identity while retaining character within the art deco form. Lakshmi Insurance Building was another fine example of, again, Master Satya and Bhuta's work. Here they work with sculptor Kamat. And what you see on top of the building is a tall statue of Lakshmi, who is the goddess of wealth. And she's astride the insurance building. And it's, it's a very clever and subtle symbolism here because you're adding Swadeshi assurance. You're, you're, you're alluding to safety and you're alluding to posterity. And that for an emerging insurance company that was going to offer insurance first time exclusively to Indians, was a very clever mixture of design and symbolism. On the panel on the right in the same building, you can see elephants in a forest, all of them in very active positions. And again, you know, they're symbolic of strength and solidity. This building is the Cotton Exchange located in a very dense area of, of South Bombay. And, and yes, those wires are for real and they do crisscross the entire neighborhood. Uh, what you see here on the building on the left, you'll see uh, a little banding come up on yellow. And this banding actually has the relief work that you see on the right in the top slide and the bottom slide. And this is again, very interesting native storytelling on an art deco building. You can see in the top slide, when you move your eye from the left to the right, you can see a man and a woman picking cotton in a field and then loading it on a truck. And then the truck 
the stems are really moving away and reaching the port where the, the you know I've now moved to the lower panel then you can see the product being discharged and weighed then loaded onto a hand cart moved to the ship and hoisted on a on a on a hook and then probably loaded onto the steamer which is the remaining part of the panel so you can see how two relief panels have been used to depict the entire process of cotton trade for a building that was the cotton exchange nalini kunj in matunga which is another suburb shows the emergence of now the devnagri skill the devnagri is hindi and you will notice that from colonial names we moved to indian family names and now the lettering changed from english to devnagri and you can also see the symbol om over here above the window and this is a sacred sound and a spiritual symbol in indian religion uh, and then of course you have the you know tropical grill on a teak wood window and you have the the ventilator at the top so you can see the stronger and stronger assertion of local identity emerging and manifesting itself in many forms this <clears throat> is a parsi fire temple it's a place of worship uh, built by the british architects of gregson batley and king uh, the font here and the lettering is uh, gujarati um, and you can see the magnificent lamasu which is a protective de- deity from assyrian mythology um, it stands about 10 to 12 feet tall and there are two of them very magnificent Hiramahal in Badala is 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 a very special building because of the very subtle demonstration of Indian uh, identity and in, in the features that it's used. You'll notice here that there is the Om sign again embedded within the sign, rising sun. Below that you have lamps which are traditionally considered auspicious and very Indian. These are wick lamps. The, filled with oil typically lit during the hindu festival of diwali next to it here you have the swastik sign which again is is very auspicious in the hindu calendar at the top here you have a band of lotus petals along the terrace of the building and then of course you have you know the streamlining the curvilinear form and the turret like features are so obvious to see and you know it's a it's a beautiful example of two styles merging together with local cultural representation just as much as the buildings were transforming and the indian identity was emerging so was the architectural practice and here you see all the indian and western deco masters as east gradually met west uh dw david william ditchburn uh Gregson Batley and King were two of the most prominent and prolific architectural firms of that time all headed by Britishers Claude Batley was an academic a practitioner he was president of the Indian Institute of Architects and he was also a uh, principal of the JJ College of Art as it was called at that time and this practice brought by the british gradually transitioned as indians took over and you have cm master pansare uh, gb mahatre what was refreshing was that these people despite being in the same trade and in similar practice all collaborated freely so you would see master sarthi and bhutra working with ng pansare you would see gregson batley and king collaborating with indian architects and uh, there was enough work to do and despite the apparently competitive environment there was a level of collaboration that was quite unprecedented in fact gb matre was known as the shadow architect because half the time he forgot or didn't care to sign the drawings which uh, he had prepared for many buildings that came up David William Ditchburn on the top left uh, apart from doing a lot of significant work in India 
also was the architect for MGM. So he built the Metro Cinema in Mumbai. He also built the Metro Cinema in Miami, the same man. And interestingly, MGM was using the cinema theater to extend its brand and to promote its movies across the country. Given all that I've shared with you, I think, you know, in any big city, the question that we constantly face is how do we save what we have? Uh, Bombay has expensive real estate. There's a constant pressure of urban redevelopment. It's a magnet for livelihood. 20.4 million people live here. Most of them, or many of them, 60, 50, 60% of them being migrants. And we have a modern living heritage that is vibrant. And I remember when I met Roberta in New York in 2018, we had a conversation about this. And, and some of the problems are no different for New York, uh, as I later realized as I spoke to her. So leading into our initiative to save what we have, I'll now introduce you to the Victorian Gothic and Art Deco Ensembles of Mumbai, which is a World Heritage Site that was inscribed in June 2018. And what makes it truly unique is that it was a stakeholder-led initiative. It was a 14-year journey. Um, it began in 2004 uh, in a small room with, where architect Abha Narayan Lamba sat with a few lack-minded people and said, how can we plan for the future to save this beautiful city and what we have? In 2012, they had on their own managed to create an entire nomination dossier that was submitted to the state government and the central government, which then went on to UNESCO to be inscribed. And this is a whole presentation in itself, including the politics of architecture. Uh, but we'll maybe if that's a conversation we can have separately. Um, this precinct is uh, covers 66.34 hectares. It has 94 buildings in it. And you can see the park down the middle, which is the Oval Maidan. Uh, it's an extension, actually, of four parks. There's one just before it, which is over here. This is the Oval Maidan. And then you have the, the Cross Maidan. And then here you have the Azad Maidan. So there are actually four big parks that run from <clears throat> south to north. And what's remarkable about this, this central park here, the Oval Maidan, is it's just 22 acres. And it has two very distinct and contrasting styles of architecture on either side in a very unique juxtaposition. And the Oval Maidan is the fulcrum around which these two ensembles were built and gave it a unique identity. Uh, I'll explain that to you a little in the, in the next couple of slides in terms of the architectural dialogue that takes place over there. Uh, UNESCO selected this precinct for two reasons, criteria two and criteria four out of the 10 criteria that are relevant for inscription of any site as a World Heritage Site was that it exhibited an important exchange of human values over time, a development and architecture, a technology, which was basically the use of reinforced concrete, town planning, where we use reclamation uh, to create land, landscape design. And then it was also significant in stages of human history because the city expanded and landfill and reclamation heralded the evolution of Bombay into a significant trading partner. And we saw two centuries, the 19th century Victorian Gothic and the 20th century Art Deco in conversation with each other. This precinct has many magnificent buildings and that's 66.4 acres. Uh, what you see here is the Prince of Wales Museum, which is done in the Art Deco, sorry, in the Indo-Saracenic style. Um, this is the Army Navy building and the neoclassical style by Gosling and Frederick Stevens. The Bombay University, after it was recently renovated and 
preserved by architect Abba Lamba. Uh, you can see the Rajabai clock tower on the right, which at 72 meters was one of the highest buildings on the city skyline for a long time. And uh, the dog uh, gargoyles on the gargoyles on the right. Sorry, uh, this is the magnificent Bombay High Court uh, built in the Victorian Gothic style, and this whole precinct is shown here to you on this map. And as I said, there are 94 buildings. They represent all these styles. There's Victorian Gothic, Industrial, Art Deco, Classical. And you can see over here that this entire strip of 35 buildings are on Marine Drive and these 18 buildings along the Oval and this entire Back Bay Reclamation Precinct is all Art Deco. So everything you see in this pink or orange color depending on the colors you're seeing on your monitor, is, is Art Deco. So 76 or 80% of the 94 buildings that were inscribed are Art Deco in style. When I talked about two centuries and a conversation of two architectural styles, I've tried to draw a parallel here between New York and Mumbai. Uh, just as Central Park is is central to the identity of New York. And I think most city uh, residents feel very strongly and passionately about it. So do the citizens of Mumbai it, feel the same way about the Oval. And what you can see here is two different colored strips. So you have pink on the left and you have purple on the right. Uh, you can see the Art Deco style on the left and the Victorian Gothic on the right. You have 19th century on your right and you have 20th century on your left. And nowhere in the world is there such a remarkable conversation uh, between two centuries and two significant architectural styles. Um, I'd like to read this remark that UNESCO made when they inscribed the precinct and they said the 19th century Victorian and 20th century Art Deco of the Bombay Back Bay Reclamation Scheme confront each other in a theatrical architectural display at the Oval Maidan. Uh, I think we're a little over time, so let me just speed this up. Uh, what has we done as our contribution to preserving this neighborhood and to create awareness within the city's residents of all our initiatives. We've done documentation, research, outreach, and advocacy. Very quickly, I'd like to share the process of how we identify a neighborhood. In this case, it's called Matunga. We mapped it. We did a building count of 273 buildings, identified 89 Art Deco buildings, which are highlighted in dark gray. And this is all extensive field work, culminating in a in what we call a photo documentation panel for each and every single building that's been identified as DECO. Our <clears throat> ongoing documentation as at 12th May 2020, uh, just after the pandemic hit, stood at 661 Art Deco buildings that we have documented after serving 1,769 buildings across the city. I'd like to leave you with a comment by Mr. Kamu Ayer, a very respected and senior architect, who mentioned that some things are worth keeping, even if they do not have a patina acquired with age. And I think that's very true of Bombay's incredible Art Deco architecture, which has now emerged from the legacy and the majesty of all the Victorian Gothic monoliths that I've shared with you. Thank you so much. I look forward to your questions and answers.